All right, so Lophotrichozoa is not a phylum. It's a larger clade that includes several phyla. So we'll talk about all the phyla that are in here. So this clade did not exist until we had DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencing indicated that there were animals that seemed extremely different in form, in embryonic development, in adult shape, yet DNA showed that they were closely related. And one of the unifying features of this clade is having a ciliated feeding structure at some stage. So either they have uh, a lophophore, which is a ciliated feeding structure found in adults, or they have a larva with cilia that feeds that way, a uh, trochophore larva. So that's how we got this word. Lophophore, trochophore, and animal. So animals that either have a lophophore, a trochophore larva, uh, we'll put that together into one really, really long word. Um, so these are bilaterally symmetric because now we're into the bilaterians. All those basal ones were not bilaterally symmetric except for the acials. And so now we're in all, everything we're going to talk about is bilaterally symmetric. Um, they're triploblastic, so that means they have a real mesoderm layer uh, in between their ectoderm and endoderm. Um, many have a silome, and they have a digestive tract with two openings, so mouth and anus, so food goes in one opening and out the other. Um, and we'll talk about, besides this group, in the next video we'll talk about the ectozoa, the animals that shed their outer layer and the deuterostomes, which is our clade. So let's look at our little uh, phylogeny here for animals. So we talked about the periphera, the nidaria, and a few other basal animals that belong over here. So the lophotrochozoa and the ectozoa are sister clades, as you can see here. And again, all the animals in here, and even a few in the deuterostomes, uh, it, the phylogenies were extremely confused and there were multiple different phylogenies when we were just basing it on morphology. As you'll see, there are some commonalities. There are some, Deuterostomia is the early development. There are some uh, ectozoa that have deuterostomic development. There's at least one ectozoa that has a lophophore-like feeding structure as an adult. There are segmented members in all three. So it, trying to figure out what to base phylogeny on, uh, DNA has really been a saving uh, technique for that. Okay, so uh, here's another phylum that is one of the big nine, the flatworms, platyhelminths, which the name literally means flatworm. Platy is fat, helminth, flat, helminth is worm. Uh, most of them are free living, but there are some parasites that are in this group as well. Um, they're triploblastic, but like the name says, they're extremely flat. They're acelomates, which means that they don't have that cavity. So that means the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm are all sandwiched together. So that limits their movement. So uh, the advantage of a salome that we talked about last time is the fact that all of the tissues and organs can slide past each other, and platyhelminths don't have that, yet they are very successful with 20,000 named species, and probably there's more undiscovered species. Their gut has a single opening. They have no circulatory system. Um, they do have, however, a primitive kidney, so the proto-nephridia uh, to get nitrogenous wastes out of the tissues, and then they, it has a duct that leads to the outside. So no circulatory system, a single opening gut, no heart, but they have a primitive, uh, primitive kidney-like structure for getting rid of nitrogenous wastes. Um, and gas exchange, they have no gills. Oxygen and carbon dioxide just diffuse that's why they have to be flat, because they don't have a circulatory system and they don't have any gills or a heart. So gases are just diffusing across the surface of the skin. 
or the ectoderm, I should say, because it's not really skin in the same sense that we have skin. Uh, the best known group of platyhelminths are planarians. Planarians live in fresh water and even in soil, uh, wet soil. Um, they don't have true eyes, but they do detect light, and that's why you know people think they look kind of cross-eyed. Those aren't really true eyes; they're just light-sensitive eye spots. They're flat spots that, ha and they, but they can tell which direction the light is, and they tend to move away from very bright light. They have a nerve net um, that's a little slightly more advanced than the jellyfish have, uh, because they have directional movement. Um, they have a head and a tail, um, and they eat other things. They're, um, uh, they eat other animals, so they're mostly carnivorous. Um, their mouth is kind of in the middle of their body, not on their head. And interestingly, they are one of the few animals that can reproduce the rest of the body if you cut them up. You can cut them up into a dozen different little pieces and each piece will grow a completely new animal. Um, parasites that are within platyhelminths, uh, tapeworms are one, uh, trematodes are another one, but look, we'll just talk about tapeworms because that's the more common one to be encountered in the United States. Um, so tapeworms are uh, uh, kind of degenerated as we see in many parasites. Parasites often lose some of the uh, body plan features and abilities that free living organisms have because they don't need a mouth to digest and eat food. They can just absorb from the tissues and from the gut of whatever organism they're a parasite in. Um, and that's what the tapeworm is. Each little segment of the tapeworm is really just a sack of reproductive tissue. Um, they absorb food directly through their uh, ectoderm, and uh, they live in the gut of vertebrates. Um, so they are very they they have a very simplified structure compared to planarians, and they do have a, a sort of a head to hold on uh, so that they don't just get pooped out. Uh, and as, the, as they grow, as segments um, multiply by segments multiply uh, asexually, uh, and then the, the segments on the end break off uh, containing new zygotes, and those have to be eaten by other animals, uh, and those leave the body through the feces but the little head stays in there. Uh, if you have a tapeworm, we have good treatments for that. Cows have tapeworms. Your dog or cat can get tapeworms from fleas. Uh, fleas are a common mode of transmission for tapeworms in the United States. Uh, they get it by, they bite themselves when they itch and they swallow the flea, and that's how they get the tapeworm. Um, there, these are two smaller phyla within uh, the Lophotrochozoa that are actual, that have lophophores as adults. So remember that was one of the qualities that we find in this group are phyla that actually have lophophores as adults. So these are two of those, the Ectoprocta and the Brachiopoda are lophophores. They have these ciliated feeding structures as adults so that makes them filter feeders. Although they do have a fairly complex body, they have mesoderm, they have a true uh, coelom, uh, and we have two phyla in that. Um, brachiopods are sometimes confused with bivalves in the mollusks because they look sort of like clam-like, but uh, they have a completely different internal structure. Um, rotifers uh, and acanthocephalans were combined into a single phylum based on DNA evidence. Uh, DNA evidence showed that they were actually really closely related, even though they don't look anything alike, uh, and they have different lifestyles. The, the biggest thing that they have in common is that they're very, very tiny. Uh, so rotifers uh, 
the name comes from the word for wheel, and that's because they have these uh, wheel-like cilia containing um, structures that they use to bring food into their mouths. But they're they're very tiny, but they're multicellular animals. Um, the acanthocephalans, these are uh, spiny heads, um, and they have uh, this long proboscis with um, a spine with little spines on it. So even though rotifers are extremely tiny, they are multicellular. This is a nice image here. You can see the little cilia. Uh, feeding structures up there at the front. They're multicellular. They are smaller than some single cells, like paramecium can be 300 micrometers in size, and rotifers are multicellular and they're smaller than that. So that means their cells are, are quite small. But they do have organs. They have endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. Um, they're pseudocoelomates, so that means that their mesoderm it doesn't separate to form the salome, that the, the mesoderm is lining the salome, but not completely. Um, and they have a one-way gut with a mouth and an anus. Um, many rotifers do not reproduce by normal sexual reproduction. Instead, they reproduce by parthenogenesis. So they, there are quite a few species known that are only females. The females lay eggs that are not fertilized. They never go through meiosis, and instead the eggs just start to divide by mitosis as if they were fertilized. Uh, and they can tell from the fossil record that some of these groups of rotifers have been reproducing this way for 50 million years. That We have rotifer fossils that are 50 million years old uh, that are clearly the same species as these ones that are um, and that only have females, and the fossils are also only of females. Uh, some of them mostly reproduce by parthenogenesis, and it only occasionally will produce males. Like if environmental conditions are really bad, they'll produce males and have actual sexual reproduction. So it's, uh, it's kind of weird. Um, another phylum within this group, um, gastrotrica, and here we see the root here that means hair. Uh, stomach and hair. So these are the hairy belly worms. Uh, very few species, only 800 species in this group. They're very small, uh, a few hundred micrometers in lakes or in length, and they live. They're bottom feeders. They live in the mud on the bottom of the ocean, in the bottom of lakes. They eat de decaying organic matter. Um, you might find them if you take a pond water sample from the bottom of the pond. Uh, and they're, um, they sort of look like, under the microscope, like nematodes, but covered with hair. So this is another one of those small groups. Um, Cycliophora, this was a recently discovered phylum. Um, and other than the ones that have been created using DNA, this is... Uh, uh, in the animals, the, mo the most recently discovered complete phylum. So a grad student who was in uh, Norway or Sweden, I can't remember, was looking at, uh, was examining live lobsters for parasites. And he discovered this really weird animal living on the mouth of the lobster, and it turned out that uh, it was so weird that it belongs in its own phylum, and DNA has supported that, that it in fact belongs in its own phylum, and so far it's only known from a couple of species of lobster. And no additional species of this weird little creature have been discovered in the meantime. Um, another group uh, in this um, clade is the Nemertia. These are this is a phylum that's also known as the ribbon worms. These are acelomates. Um, they do have a gut. They do have a um, a gut, uh, and weirdly, they have blood that's in vessels, but they have no heart. So their blood gets pumped around their body just with their muscular movements. And those vessels are compressed within solid tissue because there's no coelom. 
And here we go, another one in the big nine, the annelids or the segmented worms. And there are both marine and land annelids, although you're certainly familiar with some of the terrestrial annelids. We dissected one in lab, the earthworm. Uh, annelids are coelomates, and their bodies uh, are segmented, which is where they get their name. So annelid means little rings, because their segments kind of look like little rings. And um, before we had DNA, we used to divide up the annelids into three clades. Uh, polychaetes, which was the really hairy worms, like, these, like this bristle worm here. Uh, oligochaetes, which are the less bristly worms. And then leeches. And now DNA evidence indicates that, in fact, there's only two clades. And in fact, the oligochaetes belong inside the polychaetes. Um, so now we have two clades. The first one is the Arantians, and these uh, that means modal. Um, Arant means w w travel or walk. So the Arantians are the are all pretty motile. They're predators or grazers of algae, uh, and they don't have legs. What they have are these uh, bristly, chitin, leg-like things that they use when they move their segments to kind of uh, uh, crawl their way along. Uh, and so here again we see chitin, which we're going to see again in the arthropods, which are in the ectozoa. So again, it's chitin is found in this group, chitin is found in that group, uh, Annelids are segmented, arthropods are segmented, yet DNA says they're very distantly related. So you can see why it was so hard to group animals together. So um, there are very bristly Arantians and less bristly ones. Um, and it turns out that some of, the, some of the organisms that we thought were closely related um, based on their physical appearance are actually not so closely related. So uh, they call these parapodia because pod is foot because they're not really the same as actual legs. They're just bristles. Um, the other group within the annelids are the sedentarians and just from the name you should get an idea of what these are. So sedentarians are less mobile that doesn't mean they're not mobile at all. Some of them aren't mobile at all, but some of them are just less mobile. Some of them are tube worms. So this is a, a tube worm here, and that's a filter feeder. Um, and they have uh, gill. They either have gills or tentacles for filter feeding. Uh, but we also have leeches and earthworms in this group, which previously were not thought to be closely related to uh, these tube worms. But DNA says they are closely related, even though now they don't look a lot of like. Um, leeches are interesting. They're mostly in freshwater. Um, although there are some marine and even terrestrial ones that are that live in tropical um, forests, uh, leeches are predators of both invertebrates and vertebrates. Um, some just eat invertebrates and uh, uh, kill them, uh, eating them, and some, which was what would make them a predator and not a parasite. And some are parasites that don't necessarily kill their host. They just uh, draw liquids and blood out of their host. Some can prey on humans, but many not. Most of the leeches that you would encounter in a pond, let's say, uh, can't actually um, drink your, your blood. They, they prey on much smaller organisms, and they wouldn't have a way to do it. Although this one certainly could. Um, they also have a chemical that they secrete that prevents blood clotting, um, which is medically useful, you might imagine. Um, and they've been found, they're still used today, it's been found that uh, leeches are actually better at drawing blood out of really bad bruises um, that result from surgeries, for example. 
uh, especially for plastic surgeries like surgeries on the ear where it's very difficult for the body to heal those areas and they still sometimes use leeches after surgery to draw out the pooled blood that's in there to help it to heal better. Um, earthworms like the ones that we dissected in class are also in this group even though they're quite motile they belong phylogenetically with the sedentarians uh, and they do have tiny bristles uh, that they use to move through the soil they're not completely slippery but they're extremely tiny and you would need a microscope to see them you can't see their bristles with the naked eye um, earthworms are hermaphroditic and again that means that they produce both eggs and sperm but they generally don't self-fertilize they generally uh, uh, trade gametes with another earthworm um, some can reproduce if they're broken apart uh, some can only regenerate one half which isn't really um, the same thing okay um, this little video is kind of nice because it actually shows the earthworm mouth moving, which is something that you've probably never seen. Even if you picked up a hundred earthworms as a kid, you probably never saw their little mouth opening and closing. So this is kind of cool for that reason. Okay, there it is. See the little mouth? And so even though they seem kind of smooth, they do have a dorsal and a ventral side so there's a top and a bottom and the bottom side the ventral side does have little bristles and that helps them to grip the surface and move Um, all right, next one, mollusks, another one in the big nine. Um, mollusks are very important to people because we eat them. <laughs> There's quite a few mollusks uh, that are part of the human diet. Um, mollusks in, are uh, mostly marine. Uh, there are some terrestrial and freshwater mollusks. But by and large, this is a phylum that's still mostly in the sea. They have soft bodies and some have a shell. Uh, not all of them have a shell. Uh, some have lost their shell during the course of evolution, but it's thought that the ancestral mollusk had a shell uh, and that the ones that don't have shells like octopus have lost them through the course of evolution. Um, so we're still in the uh, Lophotrochozoa, I always want to say Lophotrochozoa because it's a combination of those two words. Um, so I'll just say it that way. Lophotrochozoa uh, because it's a combination of the word Lophophore and Trochophore. So here we have some mollusks do have a Trochophore larvae. And this is a, a snail that has a trochophore larvae, and you can see the ciliated. I'm going back to my pointer here. You can see the ciliated feeding structure on here. So we're still in the clade, the Lophotrochozoa. So even though traditionally mollusks wouldn't have been grouped together with annelids uh, and some of these other ones, you know, in some ways we we can find similarities between these groups that the DNA evidence says actually are closely related. Um, so our four major groups of mollusks are the chitons, the gastropods, which is slugs and snails, the bivalves, clams, oysters, etc., and the cephalopods, squids, octopus, cuttlefish, nautilus, um, with the gastropods being the largest group with the most species. Chitons you probably uh, haven't heard of. They're a smallish group and uh, they are uh, they're sort of flatwormish but they have hard plates on the top. They move along. They have, if you flip one over, they have a, um, a foot that looks sort of like a snail's foot and they have a radula 
uh, like snails do that they use to eat algae off of rocks. But they're very well protected from predators with their flat shape. Uh, and they, they move very slowly as well. They're not very fast at getting away from predators. Gastropods, this is the largest group of mollusks. Almost all are marine, but there are land snails and slugs. You've probably seen slugs in your garden. If you turned over rocks as a kid, like most of us did, some of them don't have a shell, and some of them have a shell only in their very juvenile or larval stages, and then they lose that shell when they're an adult. So generally, if, we, if, we, uh, if it doesn't have a shell, then we call it a slug um, or a nudibranch. Nudibranchs are just pretty slugs. Uh, and if it has a shell, then we call it a snail. And the name itself, gastro is stomach and pod is foot. So gastropod means the foot is the stomach. So, I mean, the whole body is the foot of gastropods. Bivalves include, bi means two. So bivalves have two shells, and that includes uh, clams and oysters, mussels and scallops. Some are completely sessile and don't move as adults. They ha all have motile larvae, though. And uh, some have some sensory ability. Some have eyes, like this is a scallop. Scallops have some mobility. They'll move to escape predators and swim. And they have eyes. You can see these little dark dots here. Those are eyes on the scallop. Uh, they have gills. Um, they're marine in freshwater, mostly they're marine. Um, and some have uh, uh, sensory tentacles for detecting food. Um, they're filter feeders for the most part. Cephalopods are the most intelligent mollusks. Some say they're the most intelligent invertebrates, which could be true. There's a lot of evidence for that, although we haven't tested all the invertebrates. Uh, there are some, some arthropods that are pretty smart. So uh, cephalopods have, the only hard part in their body is their beak, which is quite hard, and they use that to crush and break up their prey. And some of them have a, a, a reduced shell or no shell at all. So octopus have no shell. Cuttlefish and squid have an internal shell. And in squid, it's kind of soft and cuttlefish it's uh, it's kind of a, a hard spongy kind of a structure it kind of that's kind of what it reminds me of the cuttlefish's uh, bone or its shell it kind of reminds me of a um, a very porous bone light bone um, and a few have shells so the nautiluses are most like the ancestral cephalopods so cephalopod means head foot. So that is how they look. They have they look like they're a head with feet coming out of it, um, and that's their their legs. Um, and so that's where the name comes from. So squid and cuttlefish are in one group. Octopus are in another group, and nautilus are in a third group. The nautilus used to be much more common than they are today. They have been reduced to very few species. The squid are the most successful if you go by number of species. Um, in the cephalopods and the octopus are considered the most intelligent. Uh, there's a large group of extinct cephalopods that had shells that were like nautilus. Uh, the ammonites were extremely abundant. Their shells are so numerous that you can often find them being made into jewelry. Like this is a fossilized ammonite that's been cut in half and is being sold for to make jewelry. Um, so they're not rare at all in the fossil record. They went extinct when the dinosaurs did. So this was one of the casualties of that asteroid impact other than the dinosaurs was all the ammonites went extinct. The Nautilus survived. Uh, and so did the squid and the octopus. Um, some cephalopods are quite intelligent, including octopus. Um, and I have a little video here of 
and octopus. I have a question for you. It's okay. a battle between octopus and crab, and who do you think would win? Well, I, I think octopus. Really? They're, they're bright, they're very intelligent creatures. Well, you could be right. Of course. You would be, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, a spectacular scene, really, captured this video in Western Australia. A spectator there. You can see the crab minding its own business when an octopus jumps out of the water and onto a rock. We don't think this has ever been captured before. It then pulls the crab back underwater, and it's not every day that you see an octopus hunting on land, is it, Isa? Scientists saying, though, it can happen near any shore. Very strong, isn't he? It's a tiny octopus, too. And you won the argument, which is quite annoying, so I thought the crab. I'm Max Foster in London. I have a question. There have been cases as well of octopus that have escaped from their um, lab tanks. There have there was a um, octopus that I think this one was at the Seattle Aquarium that they were leaving a light on all night. There was a security light that was on all night and it was bothering the octopus. So octopus can squirt water as well out of their siphon. And so the octopus figured out that if he squirted water at this light, it would pop and go out. And the light kept burning out and they couldn't figure out what was happening to this light. So they finally set up a camera and figured out that the octopus was doing it because he wanted to have dark at night. He didn't want to have a light on. Um, there was another case where it was a lab octopus. They were doing experiments, intelligence experiments with the octopus, and they had a tank of fish that they used to feed the octopus. And the octopus could see the fish across the room. And he started getting out of his tank at night, going across the floor, up into the fish tank, taking a fish, and then going back to his tank. And the researchers thought that one of the janitors was stealing the fish at night. So again, he set up a camera, and it was the octopus <laughs> was getting out. And very clever that it would go back into its own tank instead of staying in the tank with all of the fish. So uh, they might be, the octopus might be the most intelligent um, uh, invertebrate. Cuttlefish as well, which are cuttlefish are more closely related to squid. They're in the squid group. Uh, they also are extremely intelligent, and um, uh, yeah, either one of those might be the most intelligent invertebrate. Um, there's a few arthropods that might challenge them on that, though, but they're a little bit less studied. Okay, in the next uh, video, we'll continue uh, with the ectozoa.